we have to restart again with humanity, with very basic, essential questions. To ask questions is starting points to find out who we are. I'm not uh, this kind of very active activist. I'm just uh, being forced to act, but uh, I'm proud of doing that because that is uh, the meaning of life, to give uh, uh, dignity to life itself. Coming up on Laura Flanders and Friends, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. keep the doors of our minds open to possibility and to fresh questions in a time when so many avenues to peace, justice, health and fresh thinking seem cut off or out of reach. In his recent graphic memoir titled Zodiac, the world-renowned artist Ai Weiwei writes that artists have a special role. They should ignite stories, fight for freedom, and help us hope. Over his long, defiant career, Ai Weiwei has done just that, using his art in a wide variety of media. His works, such as Sunflower Seeds and Remembering, confront issues of censorship and human rights abuses in China. In a recent show, he asked questions of an AI chatbot, among which was, is there hope? For peace. Ai Weiwei has faced censorship by the Chinese government and also in the West. He had a show cancelled not so long ago in London after he expressed support for Palestinian rights. In 2011, he was arrested at the Beijing airport and held for 81 days without charge. He's been living in exile since 2015. He's joining me today from where he stays now with his family in Portugal. And it is my great honor and privilege to welcome to our program Ai Weiwei. It is such a pleasure to have you here on the program with me. And I'm going to ask you the question that I begin all of our conversations with, simply to perhaps ground ourselves. Who or what is uppermost in your mind or on your heart as we start to speak today? Well, at this moment, nothing are more... I, we cannot really erase the images of the people of in Palestine, you know, this is, uh, nobody can really uh, erase those images. And uh, we never had time like this, not in my life, and uh, not in anybody's life, the images has been so uh, massively covered and, uh, and uh, brutally showing in, the, in front of the public. You just wrapped up a project in London that beamed on the lights of Piccadilly Circus in which you asked an artificial intelligence chatbot about the meaning of life, 81 questions. It was described, I saw, as an 81-day quest for enlightenment. Can you describe that project a little bit more and what you made of AI's answers and were you enlightened by any of it? First, I think in... The very critical historical moment, the every answer need to be re-asked, and uh, you know we we have to restart again with humanity with very basic, essential questions. To ask questions is the starting points to seeking for the truths and uh, to to find out who we are, and very often we forget to to about those answers. So I use uh, the po uh, possibility to ask the questions to AI, happen my name, uh, a little bit familiar with AI. So yes, we both give answers. I, I would give answers before AI gave the answer to see how much it matches and how much uh, difference we, we have. And uh, I think that is the point everybody uh, need to ask a question or ask dozens of questions about uh, who we are and where we are going. And did you get enlightened? What would, how did you compare with AI? I, I would say uh, um, 
AI can does 80 to 90 percent of the job, you know, the answer could be matches in many ways. But uh, but there's one need the individual uh, thinking or to make judgment. Uh, I think AI is not uh, capable because AI is just collecting information. Do you have hope or fear around technology or, or both? In speaking of technology, I think that technology liberates uh, people, uh, you know, every case, every individual, since they are so much involved and so much uh, adored or by the technology, you know, they you cannot stop them, you know, everybody, uh, it's impossible. It's almost become like air on or water. So, but what will come out of it, nobody know. And uh, still technology will not just develop us technology, but still need someone have a brain and have emotion, have a, a ability to, to make technology become uh, humanized. But still it need to be employed by the right people, not by the wrong people, you know, still can be, can be very evil, but uh, can be very uh, dangerous to humanity. The other thing, AI is not as real in terms of living in a body with a human type physical experience. Your, your 81 questions, of course, based on your 81 days of imprisonment. How do you think those days changed you? And now, do you think of yourself as as free? Do you feel free? I never feel free, no matter what, in the uh, this kind of confinement or outside the confinement. Uh, the inner struggle is not just with the existing condition, but also within ourselves. How do we make judgment? How do we uh, make a move or not make a move? So those things are, are really, uh, we have to ask every every second. So in that sense, freedom is only uh, intention to, to get free, but uh, rather you can never really achieve it. You write a lot though about the function and the role of the artist in Zodiac and elsewhere you've addressed this question. What do you think is, is your job? Um, I think that my job, there's a job, and even I've never been really hired, but still there's a duty. Uh, duty means re relate to, if you think you have any rights, you, you would, uh, would have a responsibility and uh, you have to pay for for whatever you get. You know, I'm a person, I eat well, I, I, I've been treated very well, and uh, even with all those difficulties still I consider we all lucky. We are we all get more than we deserved. So so who is gonna pay in that? I think all the thing I can do as an individual is defending humanity and defending basic human rights, freedom of speech. Those things are so crucial. There's something about artists though that very much scares and concerns certain sorts of governments, particularly dictatorial ones or authoritarian ones, ones that be deeply invested in control. What is it, do you think, about artists and what they do that so concerns those kinds of regimes? I think uh, we always think we were born free, but that is not true. Our education, our sense of safety, or we are we 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 have to behave like the others. We have to, uh, you know, get by uh, with this kind of mainstream uh, uh, ideologies or or propagandas. So so there's a, all different kind of uh, censorship. Some are very obvious, like in the authoritarian states, they are clearly tell you certain topic you cannot talk about. If you talk about, you touch the red line, and uh, you're dead. You you know you you you're not gonna survive. So it's very clear. But uh, I gradually found out in the West, in the so-called democratic society or land of, for freedom, which we also have a lot of a lot of taboos. 
you cannot talk about, people avoid talk about, not just uh, in ordinary situation, but even in the bar or in the coffee shop, um, in university, in education, in, in mainstream media. That means uh, we are not encourage people to have a free thinking and judgment. And uh, that is the ground to produce Nazis or uh, hypocrites, and uh, that can come to a political disaster. And of course, we see a lot of political disasters, one after another, in very different locations. So I'm hearing then that the role of the artist is to shove us out of our complacency, nudge us out of our kind of go-along self-censorship? Artists are privileged in the way because they have no job. Nobody hires them. You know, they, they don't get paid anyhow, unless they are so so crazy about their fame or to to make uh, some kind of strange amount of money. So basically the rule of artists is about a free thinking and uh, it's all about make, making mistakes because, uh, you know, the mistakes, the consequence is only you, you will pay for the mistakes. It's not you let anybody else to pay. That's the privilege of artists. That that means you're free. You're you're you have much more space, but in today's society, it's not true. And most artists, I would say, are so much worried about their reputation, about uh, uh, be accepted by large institutions or exhibitions, or um, you know, so and to be collected. So those uh, those issues uh, would affect their uh, would uh, guide them not to express their inner ideas. We have some of the same problems with journalism, um, but we can get to that. I, I hear your father in a sense. I, I think of him, and and you want to tell our audience a little bit about him. If he looked at you today and heard you talking about freedom, um, what do you think he would say? I mean, he experienced government suppression very clearly you're talking about something a little more subtle perhaps but what would he would he be surprised by the situation we find ourselves in today i think my father living uh, lived his life under very strong political censorship and uh, he paid his lifetime for that you know he was exiled he was in jail not for one year, but over 20 years. And I grew up with him. I don't think he will be surprised for, for me to fight to defend the freedom of speech. And uh, I think he, he would be proud if he knows I'm doing that. But of course, he will be worried because he knows uh, this, this kind of condition. In most cases, you cannot win. We started by talking about those images from Gaza. How do you decide to work on subjects of migration or incarceration, or as you did, the, the naming of the children killed in the earthquake in Sichuan? I, I made uh, my, how do you say, my comment, or uh, it's kind of commentary, only because those topics I, I cannot uh, avoid. To, to escape from. Uh, very often people would ask me, what's your opinion? So I have to honest to give out my opinion. I cannot say uh, I don't have any opinion about it. But, uh, you know, I'm not uh, this kind of very active activist. I'm just uh, being forced to act. But uh, I'm proud of doing that because that is, uh, the meaning of life, to give uh, uh, dignity to life itself rather than anything else. But you were pushed to focus on migrants, to focus? Yes. Uh, I was migrants, even in my, my country. My father was exiled, so we always being discriminated. We never had a place we can call home. So I always wondering, why those people have to leave their home? 
It doesn't. It doesn't make any sense. Uh, even if it's poor, they they will not leave their home willingly. Uh, just take their children, do the, all those risks across the ocean, and go to a land with no language, no religious uh, similarity. And what? How can they survive? It's not possible. So I I always wondering how that would happen. So that kind of curiosity leading me to want to know more about them and about how the other people look at them. What is the political uh, policies or positions people uh, handling those people? When you made your film Flow. Human Flow, Human yes. Flow, the migration, the numbers of migrants and people displaced, I looked it up, was like half of what it is today. Um, and you make the point that the number of borders was much more than it had been at the end of the, the Cold War, so-called, the, the bringing down of the Berlin Wall. Today, the question of home and homeland is up again. And I, and I wonder, looking to Palestine, looking to Israel, looking all around the world as we see people moving and fighting for a place to call home, um, what is home to you? Uh too late to find a home for me. I have been in China for a very long time, over 40 years. I couldn't call it home. I, I speak Chinese language. You know, my father is the most uh, respectful poet today. And uh, and I cannot call it home because we, we just uh, do not have same kind of ideology and the values we can share. And uh, I cannot speak freely in a place then you don't call it home. And uh, yes, I've been in the United States for 12 years, then I've been in Europe almost 10 years now. I still feel quite foreign in outside China. So I will not think uh, there will be a location I call home, but which is fine. You know, uh, we are, they give me opportunity to know more, to know more difficult situations and to know, there's a lot of people, they're just uh, not privileged. And uh, the whole world are facing a uh, dramatic change and this situation getting more common. Well, so maybe this is a positive, not to diminish people's right not to be displaced and forcibly moved, but I, we spoke to Angela Davis not so long ago, and, and we I asked her about nations and nation states and whether this idea that we have of a nation state is maybe out of date um, and we need to reinvent. And I think I'll, I'd ask you that same question. Do you How do you relate to the idea of a state? You, you've been subject to the power of one. You saw your father be persecuted by one as well. Um, maybe we need something else. Maybe we just need to call the planet home. Um, or our friends, or family, or some, <laughs> our art. Well, I think uh, sooner or later we have to call this. Uh, we have to recognize the planet is the only home, because our fate are uh, really bound together. You know, with this dramatic change, either environmental changes, research uh, uh, limit, and also war, can be dramatically uh, happening. So they will be rethinking about humanity as one and to rethinking about we are all share the same planet. And uh, of course, uh, the, the home, so-called the borders or nation often divide, divided by the different uh, historical uh, impact, religion or, or race or, or different kind of development, different speed. But gradually, uh, those problems shows we have to have the unity, at least uh, conceptually, we have to think humanity as one. I think the birds where you are like what you just said, because they started singing more loudly. Um, <laughs> and you have I made me think of how often nature comes up in your work. Um, what do you get from the animals that surround you, the, 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 the relationship that you have to nature. And, and do you think of yourself, you're, you're known for using a lot of technology as well. Um, 
how do you think of your relationship with nature in these times and how does it express itself in your art? I think uh, it's, I will feel ashamed if I talk about nature. We have so much, uh, so little time just to look at what is around us, you know, just grass or wood or birds or cats or dogs, whatever there is so rich and we have so little time. We have no patient and we, we quickly rush our life away before we know all those neighbors and all those fantastic creatures. We know so little about them. We are, as human, we are too arrogant. We think we are, we control the, the universe, which is not true. It's just, uh, we, we only have been here for a very short time, you know, as, as long as we don't ruin it. And we are already very fortunate. Do you have advice today to creative artists and others who've been facing censorship over their work around Gaza, around the tragedy affecting Palestinians today? Things are so simple. Do we want to see our children, our families, or even friends to face in such a difficulty and not to say, hey, stop it, no war? No war in uh, Israel or Palestine situation. No war in Russian or uh, you know Ukrainian situation or any place. Do not produce those arms. Do not sell the arms from the United States. Do not pay the arms from the United States. U.S. cannot support war anymore. You paid a little price, at least, for just a tweet. There are others who faced much more. That's that. I, I what I did is nothing compared to you know people I know in Gaza. They lost twenty members of their family. They are just journalists, and they are could be a doctor and could be someone, and they have to argue about. Hey, this is genocide. They have to argue. They don't want to spell out these words even, and they will say, "Okay, this is too much." Well, if we don't say that, can we look at the mirror? Can we look at ourselves? Who, who am I? And, uh, you know, this is, uh, that is, can be totally wrong. We are still existing in this world, not speak out the truth. To many people, not thinking about it and not knowing perhaps is more attractive than the questions that we need to be asking if we're to move forward. What fear do you have if we don't ask those questions, the right questions in the right way or often enough of enough of us? The real fear for me is we lost the ability to ask a question. We, we, don't, we lost our memory. We lost our sense of a caring, compassion, or you know, we lost this sensitivity. We become already become inhuman. Do you think we're on the verge of that? I think uh, very much so. Always, uh, there's a big part of the world. They just cannot make right judgment. Then that will lead our whole humanity into disaster after disaster. Well, we have to close. I've loved talking with you. And I will ask you the question I ask all of my guests, which is, what do you think the story will be that the future tells of this moment, of now? I think... Uh, my future is now. You are my future. I love it. Ai Weiwei, pleasure to talk with you. Thank you for spending this time with us. I, you know, I am so fortunate to get to know you. Oh, well, Thank you. It's mutual. Thank you. I enjoyed my conversation with Ai Weiwei, as you can probably tell, and there is much more of it. In the uncut version, we talk a bit about his cats. He had 40 of them when he lived in China, and one learned how to open doors for itself. Ai Weiwei is very impressed with the genius of that cat, as well he should be, but I'm particularly interested in those other 39. Were they happy enough to sit back and let that one do their door opening for them, or were they simply never struck by the question of their confinement? As I think about questions, I'm struck by the actions of so many Jewish Americans this Passover who took their Seder ritual, which is all about asking questions, 
out of private space into public space, where they raised real questions about liberation and freedom and justice for all, and the place that each one of us has in that project. If you appreciate this sort of real question asking and answering in public, then we've got a lot of good programming ahead for you here on Laura Flanders and Friends. If you want to get your own access to the uncut version of today's show or every show, then you can through a subscription to our free podcast or the information's at our website. And in the meantime, till the next time, stay kind, stay curious. For Laura Flanders and Friends, I'm Laura. Thanks for joining us. For more on this episode and other forward-thinking content, subscribe to our free newsletter for updates, my commentaries, and our full uncut conversations. We also have a podcast. It's all at lauraflanders.org. 